Hello, I'm Grace Helland and I'm sitting back here in the back 40s with our beautiful scenery and today we have with us uh, Daniel Helland, um, a writer and a Reformation historian. Um, thanks for being here with us today, Daniel. No so problem. I hear you're writing a book. Yes, I am under the title More Than Conquerors. It's going to be re released this year or the year, uh, the year following. I'm getting really excited for it. It's going to be a tale of uh, bravery and heroism in 16th century France. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited for it. Which is why you came all the way out here for an interview. Um, so we have a few questions for you today, Daniel, and our first one is simply this. Um, why did you pick a 16th century uh, setting for your book? Really, I think it was an incredible time period. I mean, you have the New World being discovered, and at that time, it really was the New World. The Europeans called it the New World because they simply didn't know it had been there before. And so, it's really, to them, it's full of mystery and strange creatures and people and treasures and resources that can be exploited. Uh, the age of exploration had dawned on the world and the Europeans uh, are left realizing that they are not the only ones. Secondly, you have the preaching of the Reformation that's completely that completely turns the world upside down. The preaching of people like Martin Luther and John Calvin challenging the Catholic system, which was wedded closely with um, state authority. You didn't have the separation of church and state at that time. And so uh, these preachers are taking the word of God and they're comparing it to what they have in the status quo. And they're saying, something's not right. We need a reformation. And so between the discovery of the new world and the dynamic preaching of the reformation, a lot of things are hitting the world at one time in the 16th century. So why don't you tell us who are exactly the Huguenots? So that's a good question. A lot of people don't know who the Huguenots were. Um, there's been a lot of transliterations of what the word Huguenot actually means and nobody's quite sure uh, what, it, what it means, um, uh, which one of those transliterations are correct. But the most broad uh, general term for Huguenot, uh, the Huguenots were uh, French Calvinists specific to France. They were the ones who held to Reformation teaching in France at the time and they struggled with the royal authority with the king or the, the noble fam the traditional noble families like the Guises. They struggled with these people for eight wars um, in France uh, and so th th that's, that's the broad general term of who the Huguenots were I think. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and tell us who your main character is. Hi, right, so my main character is a young man named Theodore Kasser, uh, and he's actually not French. He was born in Switzerland, um, in French-speaking Switzerland, right over the Alps by the uh, uh, Lake Geneva, you have the city of, you guessed it, Geneva. And that's where Calvin, um, he came from France to Geneva to be a pastor. Well, he didn't originally come there t with that in mind, but when he went there, he was a pastor there for the rest of his life. And he completely uh, changed and reformed the city of Geneva. And so in my book, you find Theodore Kasher, my main character, he actually uh, met, met John Calvin. John Calvin was his pastor. He heard him preach and John Calvin's best friend. Theodore de Biza took control of the Genevan University when uh, John Calvin died. The Genevan University uh, was the greatest um, Reformation center of learning in Europe at the time. So you have Theodore de Biza, uh, no, Theodore, my main character, uh, studying there um, at the beginning of the book before he ultimately decides to cross over the Alps and joined the Huguenots in France fighting for religious liberty and the right of the individual to read the Bible on his own. All right, so could you fill us in on a few of the main historical figures and places in your book? You betcha. Um, uh, like I said, the 16th century was a really colorful time period and it's completely different than, uh, well, in some ways than what we have today. Uh, so there's a lot of 
different bad guys and a lot of different good guys, a lot of different powerful people at that time. It was really just a completely different world that uh, back then. I think it's almost comparable to um, the Middle Earth of Lord of the Rings or something like that. Just all these colorful characters that I've gotten to know by reading about them in, in this history. And one of uh, the most powerful people, uh, Philip II, he owned more uh, of land mass than probably any other monarch in history. Philip II. Uh, he was a really ruthless man uh, and he was... Uh, he could not tolerate Protestantism at any level. And so he sends his armies out all over Europe to uh, crush the Protestants like the Huguenots or um, most notably the Dutch in the Netherlands. So um, he, he was the Holy Roman Emperor. And if you see a picture of him, I'm sure you think immediately, wow, look how holy he is. Uh, so, but on the other hand, Another notable character is Gaspard de Coligny, and he's the one who I actually um, want to pay tribute to in writing this book, Gaspard de Coligny, the Admiral of France. Um, he was a favorite of the king. He had uh, a good, bright future ahead of, him, ahead of him of fortune and prestige, but he let it all go because he wanted, because he was converted and he wanted to go and help the Huguenots. And they really needed his help because they needed his military experience. So, uh, and the king at the time was King Charles IX. And he's another colorful character, I think. Uh, you'll see him a lot in my book. He liked to play ping pong and table tennis, interesting enough. But he was constantly being pulled between the Council of Gaspard de Coligny and the Council of, um, uh, his mother, and eventually his mother, Catherine de Medici, um, uh, the woman of the Renaissance really, she, her appeals won out and he did something very terrible um, uh, that would keep him miserable for the rest of his life. Okay, and another important place of, um, that, you, that the characters in my book are often coming to is the great city of La Rochelle. This was the pillar of Protestantism in France. It was essentially the Protestant Paris. And um, they actually thought of themselves as the French Geneva. They modeled themselves after Calvin's Geneva. And they were a state within the state in constant insurrection to uh, the crown, the beautiful and rebellious city of La Rochelle. It was ac it's actually besieged in my book in 1570. 1572 into 1573 uh, and it's a really massive siege that I'm not going to tell you too much about now you have to read read the book for and um, so uh, La Rochelle that was uh, the greatest stronghold of the Huguenots another important character uh, that is referred to often in my book was the Duke of Alva uh, Francis uh, no Fernando Alvarez de uh, Toledo was his name and he was a really ruthless man uh, and he was always sending ambassadors to the French king telling him to follow his example and uh, uproot these these pernicious heretics in the land so you mentioned the Duke of Alva wasn't he like the enemy of the Dutch Calvinists during the um, Dutch War for Independence he was and if you read my book, you find that um, the Dutch um, and the, uh, the Huguenots were actually allies against um, either the Spanish or who whatever Catholic war powers were set against them. And if you look through history, the Dutch sea beggars, which were essentially pirates, um, Dutch pirates who fought against the Spanish on the high seas, um, they had three ports. Um, one in Brielle, in their own homeland that they took uh, from the Spanish. Another in England, but eventually they were ousted from that by the rather fickle Queen Elizabeth. And, and then they had one in the city of La Rochelle. They had a seaport uh, with the Huguenots in La Rochelle. And so, um, actually in my book, my main character, Theodore, he eventually amasses a, sort of a mini army of these sea beggars that go across the seas to Brazil to rescue the uh, island colony of Chastain. Okay, so um, 
For many of the people out there, especially the boys, what's going to make a good buck is the battles. They love the battles. So uh -huh. maybe could you tell us about uh, maybe a few of the main battles in your book? Yeah, definitely. Um, there were two I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, the Battle of Jarnak. And these were massive battles at these times. At the time we were uh, sort of inventing firearms like the arquebus and the pistol, but you still had pis uh, you still had pikes and um, broadswords and whatnot from the medieval centuries before. So these were massive, um, really interesting battles. One of the most important, uh, one that's in my book, is the Battle of Jarnak. And the Huguenots actually lost this battle. But in this battle, perhaps the most spirited charge of all of the wars took place by uh, the prince, the Duke of Conde, the Prince of Conde, or Duke of Conde. Um, and uh, the Duke of Conde unfortunately lost his life in that battle, but it's one of the most spirited charges of probably all eight wars uh, the Huguenots fought against their Catholic oppressors. Uh, another interesting battle is the Battle of Moncontour. Another p massive battle, thousands of um, of these uh, the Huguenots or the Catholics or the um, uh, Lance Quinets um, that were hired hired mercenary warriors. Thousands of these dying on the fetal field of battle. Um, uh, and again, in this battle, the Huguenots were not victorious, uh, and the Catholics thought they had crushed the Huguenots beyond recovery in this battle, but as history plays out, you find the Huguenots, they weren't going to stop fighting for what they knew was right. Okay, so what do you want your readers to take away from your book, More Than Conquers? Well, I want them to know, I want them to have a better understanding and a better respect for these reformers and their families and the people who supported them in the 16th century during this time of Reformation. You're talking, they're, they're constantly getting, fighting wars and, and battles, or they're being massacred by mobs amassed from the cities that come out to, to hunt them like mice, um, or soldiers coming into their towns and villages. This was a completely different time period that is, we, we as 21st century Americans who have the Bill of Rights, uh, and uh, and uh, liberties enshrined in our founding documents, we can't even understand, we can't even fathom having a prayer meeting uh, being stormed by people uh, and being killed or burned at the stake. We don't have any of that in 21st century America, but, um, but that's, that's what freedom w was worth to um, these Huguenots, and that's what it cost. Um, many of them died, but what they died for never did die. The concepts and the principles that they uh, knew were right uh, continued on into twenty for uh, into all the way to the present day. Uh, eventually, the Huguenots were overwhelmed. Uh, not in my book, but beyond that, if you look through the pages of history, eventually the Huguenots died out. Um, and uh, um, that's why we have the France we have the day. You think of the. Um, the reign of terror that comes to France in the following century, so um, or following uh, uh, two centuries, but um, but the Huguenots, many of them migrated here to America, and that's why um, uh, um, our founding fathers they didn't want to have to go through all of this again. They knew what religious liberty had co had cost and they enshrined it in our documents that we could have those freedoms today. So I want 21st century Americans to not take these freedoms for granted. And uh, I want them to see that freedom truly wasn't free. Okay, um, so thanks a lot for doing this interview with us, Daniel. We we're glad to have you. So just for our listeners, can you once more uh, give us a title to keep an ear out for? Yep, it's More Than Con Conquerors, Lord of Chastain, coming out this year or the next. Keep an ear out for it. Um, you can keep uh, see updates on it on my blog, which is blog.helenfamily.com, Daniel in the Writer's Den. Uh, that is blog.helenfamily uh, slash Daniel in the Writer's Den. I hope you check it out, and thank you for uh, uh, tuning in with us today. All right, well, thanks for coming, Daniel. <laughs> no problem.